Mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs are three ways that you can invest your money in the stock market, but they can come with very different investment results. When I invest my money, there's two things that I always look for. I look at how much risk is involved, and I look at how much money I can potentially make. If I was gonna invest $10,000, and I had to decide between investing this $10,000 into my broke cousin Bunty, who's on his 34th business idea, or investing this money into Amazon, who's established and has a business plan and is very successful, I'm going to expect very different returns to justify my investment. Bunty is a risky investment, so I'm going to need bigger potential returns to justify me giving him my cash because as soon as I give him the $10,000, there's a good chance that he's going to invest that money into a new Gucci wardrobe. I gotta look good for the business. Deciding between investing your money in my cousin Bunty or Amazon is pretty obvious. I'm gonna invest my money in Bunty. But what if you had to decide between investing your money between Amazon and Apple and FedEx and Verizon and McDonald's and Microsoft? Who's gonna give you the best return for your risk now? Not so easy anymore. There's three different ways that you can take this. Option one is you can spend all the time researching these companies and you might decide that Apple is the best company to invest in based off of all your research and now you invest all your money into Apple. This one has the most risk because now if Apple releases a really bad iPhone and people start hating Apple products and their company tanks, well, down with it goes your money. It also comes with the most upside because now if you're right and Amazon wins big, then you're gonna win big. Option two is now you can open up a stock brokerage and instead of just investing in one company like Apple, you can invest in every one of these companies. That way you're lowering your risk. This one requires more work because now you're not just managing and monitoring one stock. You gotta manage and monitor a whole portfolio of your stocks. Or option three is you can pay a small fee and then you can invest in a fund like a mutual fund or an index fund or an ETF and let these funds invest in all these companies for you. So now instead of you going out and investing in all these companies, you invest in a fund that gives you exposure to all these companies. Well, all three of these funds give you exposure to the stock market. They work in very different ways, which can affect how much money you make, which is why you want to understand the differences. And that's what I'm going to be going over in this video as soon as you fund that thumbs up button below. Let's start with mutual funds. Mutual funds are known as actively managed funds. And to understand how they work, let's assume for the sake of this example that this is a mutual fund that's made up of only four stocks. A lot of times mutual funds will have way more stocks, sometimes hundreds of stocks, but just to keep things simple, we're gonna assume that this mutual fund only has four stocks. If you wanted to invest in McDonald's, Tesla, Apple, and Amazon, one thing that you could do is you could go out, open a stock brokerage, and individually invest in McDonald's, Tesla, Apple, and Amazon, but now you have to decide how much of your money are you gonna allocate towards each stock, and what stocks do you wanna own. On the flip side, when you invest in a mutual fund, you have this person right here. We're gonna call this person a money manager, and we're gonna draw him a nice mustache. This money manager is who you're trusting. So you're gonna give your money to this money manager, and this money manager is gonna create this fund. So this person is managing this fund, and when this money manager likes a stock, they're gonna buy it. When they don't like a stock, they will sell it. So maybe right now this money manager likes these four stocks, but some time goes by and he's like, you know what, I don't like McDonald's anymore. We're gonna replace them with Chipotle. So now he's monitoring the stocks and he's actively buying and selling based off of what he thinks is going on in the market and based off of what he thinks is gonna make this fund more money. The whole point of a mutual fund is to have a really smart money manager with the goal of this money manager being able to beat the general stock market. So you are hoping that by paying this money manager a fee, you are going to be able to outperform the stock market, which in turn will make you more money. You're also getting the benefit of passiveness because now you're not having to go out and individually invest in all of these companies and manage each one of these companies. You have a money manager who's going to do that. And you also have the benefit of diversity because now this money manager is diversifying your money into different companies. If you want to invest your money into a mutual fund like this, you can expect this to cost you something like 2% a year on all of your assets. What that means is if you deposit $100 into your mutual fund, this money manager is gonna take $2 a year to manage your $100. So if you invest $1,000, that's $20 in fees, and if you invest $100,000, that's $2,000 a year in fees. Now, while 2% might not sound like a lot of money, it does add up, especially as your money grows and compounds. Like if you started investing $500 a month today, and you were paying 2% a year in fees, and you were able to get an average 7% return on your money, over the next 30 years, Years, you're gonna end up paying something like $166,000 in fees to your money manager just to invest your money. Now look, I'm a value person. If you can make me an extra $1,000, I will gladly pay you an extra 2% in fees. So if you can make me more money, I will pay you more money as long as I continue to come on top. The only issue with this is what we've seen over the long term is 
these mutual funds don't always outperform the market. Actually, a lot of mutual funds can't even meet the returns of the general stock market over the long term. Like Warren Buffett was so confident in this that he made a $1 million bet that the general stock market, the S&P 500, would be able to outperform a number of hedge funds. These are highly sophisticated, highly expensive hedge funds. And over a course of 10 years, the hedge funds did well, but they did not even meet the stock market returns. So then the hedge fund owner had to then pay Warren Buffett a million dollars because he lost the bet, and Warren Buffett took that million dollars and he donated it to charity. I'm gonna go over how you can get the general returns of the stock market without paying these high fees, but in general, a mutual fund's goal is to be able to beat the market. That's why you're paying these fees to a money manager, that way you have somebody who can hopefully beat the market. The only problem with that is a lot of times you will not beat the market. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. It's really hard to predict because it's hard to beat the market, especially over the long term. This is not to say that mutual funds are never the right answer. I mean, there are some really good mutual funds out there, but a lot of these really good mutual funds are reserved for super high net worth people. Like you need at least half a million dollars to get into some of these mutual funds versus some of the regular mutual funds that you're just paying 2% on. You could get a better return without paying all the fees. Second, let's talk about index funds. So the whole idea of index funds came about by this company called Vanguard. And Vanguard said, you know, what if we could let people invest in a group of funds like this without paying these super high fees? Well, the only issue with that is you need to pay this money to a money manager. So if Vanguard wanted to create this index fund where you can invest in a fund without paying all these fees, they also had to get rid of this person with a mustache right here. And instead what they did was they replaced that person with a mustache with a computer who automates this investments. Now you're investing in a fund, a group of companies, but instead of having a money manager decide which companies are in this fund, you're gonna have a computer decide. So you create an algorithm. What are the type of companies you want to invest in? You punch that into the computer and then the computer decides what company fits that fund. For example, I just talked about investing in a fund that gives you exposure to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is an index, meaning it's a group of stocks that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. Now, one thing you can do is go out and individually invest in all 500 of these companies, but that's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of management headache. Or you can invest in an index fund that gives you exposure to all 500 of these companies. That's what Vanguard allowed you to do. Now you can just invest in this index fund and that gives you exposure to these top 500 companies. So now you're getting exposure to the general stock market without paying all the fees. VFIAX is the Vanguard index fund that gives you exposure to the general stock market. So Vanguard is the company that created this index fund. There's a bunch of banks and a bunch of companies that create these type of things. Vanguard is just one of those companies that was the first to create index fund. So Vanguard has this index fund, which is a group of stocks that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies. And if you wanna know how much fees these index funds cost, all you gotta do is search it on Google. So like with this VFIAX, you can see it says in the title that this is the Vanguard 500 index fund admiral shares. It has the word index fund in the title, so you know it's an index fund. And over here, you can see something called the expense ratio. This expense ratio is how much money you're gonna be paying in fees. That's what you wanna pay attention to. 0.04% in fees means that for every $100 you invest, you're gonna be paying four pennies in fees. Compare that to the 2% fee you'd have to pay with a mutual fund where you're paying $2 out of every $100 you invest. So the fees with an index fund are way less because now you substituted that money manager with a computer and computers are a lot cheaper to maintain than people especially if they have a mustache. What you have to understand about index funds is a lot of them have a minimum investment. Like this Vanguard index fund has a minimum investment of $3,000. So if you don't have $3,000 to invest, you cannot invest in this index fund. And you also can't just buy and sell this index fund whenever you like. Index funds like VFIAX only let you buy and sell this index once a day. So if you're trying to trade index funds and mutual funds, that's not the way to go because you can't just buy and sell an index fund whenever you want. You can only do that one time in the day and typically it happens at 4 p.m. as soon as the market closes. But if you're looking to be a long-term investor, it really shouldn't matter too much because now you're looking to invest for the long-term, you're not looking to invest for two hours. And so what happens now is you're not gonna see people trading these index funds every single day because you just can't do that. The alternative to investing in an index fund like this is investing into an ETF. ETF, which stands for an exchange traded fund, because ETFs that you buy and sell these funds kind of like stocks. You can buy and sell these ETFs whenever you want. And some index funds have ETF versions of them too. Like if we go back to the Vanguard website, you'll see that this index fund also has an ETF version. It says it right below the title. 
also available in an ETF. If you click that button, it will take you to the ETF version of this index fund, which is VOO. VOO is an ETF that gives you exposure to the S&P 500, so the top 500 companies in the stock market, and this has an expense ratio of 0.03%. You can find this the same way you find the expense ratio of an index fund, to search it on Google, and on its website, it will tell you what its expense ratio is. That's how much money you have to pay in fees every single year. So here, if you invest $100, you're going to be paying three cents a year in fees, so almost nothing. But unlike an index fund, you can buy and sell shares of VOO every single day whenever you want when the market is open. Remember, with the Vanguard Index Fund, you had a $3,000 minimum investment and those transactions only happen once a day. With VOO, you don't have a minimum investment. All you have to do is buy one share of this ticker symbol and then you can buy or sell VOO whenever you want throughout the day. So between this Vanguard ETF that gives you exposure to the S&P 500 and the Vanguard Index Fund that gives you exposure to the S&P 500, they both charge you essentially the same fees. They both invest in the same companies. The difference is VOO, you can see the real-time price throughout the day versus the index fund you cannot. VOO does not have a minimum amount of money you have to invest versus the index fund you do. However, the index fund allows you to automatically invest or withdraw your money versus this ETF does not. So if you invest your money through Vanguard, you can automatically reinvest more money every single month through Vanguard versus with this ETF, you cannot do that. So if you're looking for a passive way to invest your money, the index fund gives you the benefit because now your money can automatically be invested every single month without you having to do anything versus you can't do that with an ETF unless you're using a brokerage that can passively invest your money for you. The whole reason for you to invest your money into these passive investments is to see your money passively grow and compound over time. But if you want to see your money really compound quickly, you got to keep adding money to your investments. And the simplest way to do that is every single month, just add more money into this fund. So if you invest your money into the index fund, that can automatically happen. You can't do that with this unless you use a brokerage that automatically pulls money out of your savings account or your checking account and they invest this money into your fund. If you want to learn more about how to do that, our team put together an article that breaks down the basics of investing and I'll link it for you in the the description below. So ETFs work almost the exact same way that stocks do because you can buy or sell shares of an ETF the same way you do a stock. You can see the real-time price of an ETF the same way you can do a stock and you don't have a minimum investment you have to invest minus the share price the same way you do a stock. Index funds on the other hand can give you exposure to all the same companies and they let you do the automatic investing too. When it comes to your money actually being invested in an ETF or an index fund, there's an algorithm that tells the computer which company should be in your fund. So if you're investing in this ETF or in this index fund that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies, now what this algorithm is going to look at is which companies are in the S&P 500. If one of the companies in here, so let's assume Tesla for the sake of this example, tanks and Tesla stops making money and their market cap decreases, then what this index fund will do is say, okay, Tesla is no longer in the S&P 500. They're no longer one of the top 500 companies or the biggest 500 companies. So they're going to kick Tesla out and they're gonna put in whatever the new company is that replaces Tesla. So it happens passively. You don't have to do anything. This happens in your index fund for you. And because this is happening through an algorithm, through a computer, you get to pay way less fees. So between mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs, which one can make you the most money? Well, before I say that, let me just remind you that investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money. So make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. In general, for the majority of people, I mean, there's always gonna be outliers and exceptions to the rule, but for the majority of people in general, Index funds and ETFs are gonna be the better way to go because now you're going to meet the stock market returns and you don't have to pay the super high fees. Now, obviously there are some mutual funds that are gonna do great. There are some mutual funds that are gonna greatly outperform the market, but there's a chance that you might not get that mutual fund. There's a chance you're gonna pay the high mutual fund fees without even getting the market returns. So if you believe in the American economy, then you're gonna believe in the American stock market, which means over the long run, the stock market will continue to go up. And if that's the case, then you can just get the consistent returns of the stock market by investing your money in the general stock market, by investing in an ETF or an index fund that gives you exposure to the general stock market. Between an ETF and an index fund, this is really personal preference. I mean, do you wanna have the automatic reinvestment into an index fund or do you wanna just invest your money into a brokerage that can automatically invest your money for you. Personally, I like ETFs because I like the freedom that comes with them. The key to succeeding with any of these is really just consistently investing your money month after month after month and keeping your money in the market for long enough. History has showed us that the stock market and the economy always goes up. That doesn't mean it'll always go
go straight up, sometimes it will come down, sometimes it will crash, and sometimes it will correct. But over the long run, it will continue to go up as long as the economy keeps growing. So if you believe in the American economy, then this is a way for you to get that upside without actually starting your own company. If you've been looking for specific ETFs to invest your money to build wealth and compound your wealth, you are in the right place because in this video, I'm going to be going over three different ETF strategies that you can use right now to start building and compounding your wealth. We're going to jump back into the show in just a minute, but before we do, here are a few words from our sponsor, M1. If you've been watching my videos, you've probably heard of me talk about passively investing your money in the stock market where you have a CPA, a consistent, passive, and automatic system where money is automatically invested into the stock market for you. Well, a super easy to use platform that can help you passively invest your money into the stock market is M1. And as a little disclaimer, at the time of me recording this video, M1 is a tool that I use to passively invest my money into my portfolio of ETFs. The way it works is you get to create your pie or your portfolio of ETFs or stocks that you want to invest in. And then you can create a cadence of how often you want to invest into this portfolio of ETFs or stocks. For me, I invest every Wednesday, you can invest every two weeks, every month. But once you pick the cadence, you set it and forget it. And M1 is completely free for you to use. Now, of course, investing has risks. Are you guaranteed to make money when you invest? No, of course not. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point, which is why you want to always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube but you can mitigate some of your risk by investing your money into good assets for the long term, which is why I invest my money into my portfolio of ETFs, whether the market's up and down because I'm investing for the long term. Now, of course, you want to do your own research, get a financial advisor if you need one, but M1 is a great tool that can allow you to passively invest your money yourself. Minority Mindset is a paid partner with M1, meaning if you use them, we will get compensated, but there's no additional cost to you. So if you want to learn more and create a free account with M1, I got the link to hike into down in the description below, or you can go to the minority mindset.com slash M1. That's the minority mindset.com slash the letter M and the number one. And with that, let's go back to the show. I have two different strategies when it comes to investing my own money in the market. I have a passive strategy and an active strategy. My active strategy is where I'm looking for companies, individual stocks, and when these companies go down in price, that's when I come in and buy. So it's more active because I'm actively watching the price of these stocks. I want to see a good price for me to come in and buy, and I'm actively researching each one of these companies. I'm listening to their earnings calls, I'm paying attention to their cash flows. So I'm paying attention to what these companies are doing, and when I see a good price, that's when I come in and buy. My passive strategy is when I buy ETFs. So an ETF is an exchange traded fund, and every week I have a strategy where money leaves my account and automatically gets invested into these ETFs that I've already pre-selected. It doesn't matter if the market is up or down. My passive strategy happens every single week, and this happens passively and automatically where money automatically leaves my account and it gets invested into these ETFs. You can think of investing in an ETF like investing in a group of stocks. Because if you go out and let's say you invest in the Amazon company, AM, ZN, and you think that Amazon is going to rule the world, you buy the stock, but then something happens. Their executives run the company into the ground, and now the Amazon company goes bust. Well, now, so does your investment because now you invested your money into this company and you're hoping to see a lot of upside because you did your research, you're hoping that this company would grow, but you were wrong. If this were to happen, now you lose your investment. Versus if you invest in an ETF, now you invest in a group of stocks. So this ETF might have companies like Amazon. Now I'm not saying this is what's gonna happen to Amazon, just an example, but this ETF might have Amazon and McDonald's and Coca-Cola and a whole bunch of other companies. Now, if Amazon were to go bust, you're okay because your ETF doesn't just have Amazon. It has Amazon and hundreds of other companies in there and you're getting exposure to all these companies. So if one company were to go bust, if one company were to go bankrupt, you're okay because you have other companies to balance it out. The advantage with this is obviously you have less risk because now you're not just investing in one company, you're investing in a whole bunch of different companies and it requires less work on your end because now you don't have to individually research every single one of these companies. You find the right ETF, you buy it, and then you just keep letting the ETF do its thing. The downfall with ETFs is you also limit some of your upside because now instead of just investing in one company, you're investing in a whole bunch of companies. And if now the opposite happens, you invested in Amazon and they 
did take over the world. They started ruling the world, but now your investment here will be worth way more. And in this case, you'd have Amazon in your ETF, but it'd be balanced out by some of the losers. So with ETFs, you get more kind of a normalized return because you have some winners and you have some losers, which are balanced out. But in this case, you also have the risk of your company going bust and you have to put in all the research. So for most people who don't want to put in all the work or who don't want to take on the extra risk and who don't want to keep up with companies, they just want to invest their money in the market and let the market do its thing without investing all that time. Well, ETFs are a better and easier strategy for you. And that's why I want to go over three different types of ETFs with specific ETFs that you want to consider investing your money in. That way you can grow and compound your wealth. So let's start by talking about the first kind of ETFs that you want to consider investing your money in. That way you can grow and compound your wealth. But before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash the thumbs up button below. And if you haven't already, be sure to join our free Discord server called the Guac Talk community. We call it Guac Talk because as we all no, extra guac is truly a symbol of extra wealth. And in this community, you can chat about all things minority mindset. You can chat about the stock market, the real estate market, the cryptocurrency market, and all things building wealth. This community is completely free and it's a place for you to network with and talk with other minority mindset thinkers. So if you want to learn more and check out our free Discord server, I'll put the link to where you can do that in the description below. So the first kind of ETF that you want to consider investing your money in is an ETF that gives you exposure to the S&P 500. A couple examples of this would be VOO and SPY. Now, a couple disclaimers before I get into this. Uh, you are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money. So you should always, always, always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different ETFs in this video. Some of them I have invested my money in myself and I will give you those disclosures like I've invested my own money in VOO. But the reason why I say you need to always do your own due diligence is because because what's right for me isn't always gonna be right for you. So just make sure you do your own research. The S&P 500 is an index, meaning group of stocks, which are the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. So if you go to the stock market and you pick out the 500 biggest companies by market cap, meaning the valuation of these companies, this gives you the S&P 500. Now, instead of you going out and individually investing in all 500 of these companies, you can invest in something like VOO or SPY. These are the ticker symbols for the ETFs if you invest in either one of these, you are now indirectly investing in all 500 of these companies because VOO and SPY both invest in the S&P 500. They give you exposure to the S&P 500, the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. Now, when it comes time for you to actually invest your money into an ETF, there are three big questions you always want to ask. The first question is who made the ETF? Second is what do these ETFs actually invest in and what percentage of each company? And third is fees because you don't want to give all your money to fees. And so you got to understand these three questions to help you understand where you should actually put your money. So let's start talking here. Who made this ETF? VOO is an ETF made by Vanguard and SPY is an ETF made by Spider. SPDR, they're pronounced Spider. But these are two different companies, both investment companies that create ETFs which allow you to now buy ETFs. Both Vanguard and Spider are both very reputable companies. And so when it comes time for you to actually research ETFs, ETFs, you want to look at how credible is the company that created the ETF because you're going to have a whole bunch of newer no-name companies releasing ETFs and index funds all the time. But if they have no credibility, they have no history, you don't want to just dump your money into them because what if they go bust? So you want to look at who made this ETF, Vanguard and the Spider, and also along with that, how many people are actually investing their money into these ETFs? How big are these ETFs? The easiest way to find that information is just to go onto the Vanguard website or the Spider website and actually look at these ETFs. They'll have a fact sheet that will give you a bunch of information, everything you need to know about the ETF itself. So if you go onto the Vanguard website, here I'm on the VOO page and you see it says the fund total net assets, which is $829 billion for VOO. And then if I come onto the Spider website under index statistics, it says the weighted average market cap, which is currently 668 million million, which is $668 billion. If you search online, the general rule of thumb is if you're investing in an ETF, you want to look for an ETF that has at least $10 million in market cap of actually assets that are being managed in order for it to be an actual worthwhile investment to protect your money. But I like to look at something a little bit safer, especially if it's an ETF because I want my money to be safe. So I'm looking at at least $100 million on the low end 
of assets under management. And both of these in the hundreds of billions are way past that. So we know that one, they're made by a company that's credible. And second, that they have enough assets under management for it to be an okay investment. The second question you wanna ask yourself is what companies do these two ETFs invest in? So we know that both of these ETFs give you exposure to the S&P 500, meaning they both invest in the same 500 companies, but they don't invest in the same 500 companies with the same ratios. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going back onto the Vanguard website, and right now I can see that the 10 largest holdings are number one, Microsoft, number two, Apple, number three, Alphabet, which is Google, four, Amazon, Tesla, and on and on and on. But if I go to SPY, I'm gonna see here at the top holdings, number one is Apple. Number two is Microsoft. Number three is Amazon. Number four is Tesla. Number five is Alphabet. So you can see it's very similar companies, but what you see is that the percentages are different because in SPY, Apple is the number one holding versus in Vanguard, Microsoft is the number one holding. This question is gonna have a lot bigger implications and the other ETFs that I talk about because those other ETFs are gonna be investing in different companies and different types of companies. But in this case, both of these ETFs are investing in the same companies, just in a different ratio and a different percentage of each one. So you can take a look at them, see what their top holdings are and see which ones you like better. Now, in general, you don't need to spend a ton of time trying to get into the nitty gritty of each individual company in these ETFs because the whole point of investing your money into an ETF ETF is for it to be passive. And so you just want to get a kind of general idea of which companies that they're investing in. And if you like the companies, then the ETF might be a good investment for you. And the third question you want to ask before you invest your money into any ETF or index fund or mutual fund or really any investment is what are the fees. So in general, ETFs have much lower fees than something like a mutual fund because these ETFs are passively managed. So a mutual fund, which is something that a lot of people are familiar with, is when you invest your money into this fund, but it's managed by a person, this money manager. And because it's actively managed by a person, their goal is now trying to beat the market and they're also gonna charge you a lot higher fees. And the problem with that is, sure, they're trying to beat the market, but over the long term, most money managers cannot beat the market year after year after year. So you end up actually losing because you also have to pay much higher fees on top of all of that. Now, there are some instances where a mutual fund can be beneficial if you can get access to the right mutual fund. But in general, that's the thing that you gotta be aware of. With ETFs, generally you have much lower fees because now they're passively managed, meaning that they're managed by a computer. So a computer is gonna look at the index, they're gonna look at the rules. The rules are here that it's investing in the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. So if a company becomes smaller than one of these top 500 companies, the computer is going to kick that company out and add in a new company. So it's very passive, which is why your fees are less, but you still want to pay attention to what the fees are. The way you do that is by looking at the expense ratio. And here on the Vanguard website, you'll see that the VOO expense ratio is 0.03%. And on the SPDR spider website, you'll see that the gross expense ratio is 0.0945%. So the expense ratio or fees for VOO and SPY are both extremely low, but the SPY fees or expense ratio is about three times higher than VOO, but relatively, they're both very, very, very little. I mean, an expense ratio of 0.03% means that if you invest $1,000, your fees are gonna be 30 cents for every $1,000 that you invest, and an expense ratio of 0.03%. 0.09% means that your fees are gonna be 90 cents for every $1,000 that you invest. So both very, very little. Now, the reason why I talk about investing in the S&P 500 ETF is because this is a way for you to get general exposure to the stock market. You're just investing in the biggest 500 companies in the stock market, and now if the stock market goes up, your fund will typically go up. If the stock market goes down, your fund will also typically go down, but this is a way for you to grow and compound your money because now, you're just investing your money in the market and letting the market do its thing. So if the economy continues to grow and the market continues to grow, well now your money's growing and compounding because you have exposure to the general market. You're getting exposure to the American economy and the American stock market. And this is one of the most accessible ways to do that because you're just investing in the biggest 500 companies on the market. The second type of ETF that you may wanna consider investing your money in is a growth ETF, especially if you have more time on your side because this is a way for you to get exposure into faster growing companies. Now, faster growing typically also means higher risk, but you also have higher potential for more growth. The reason why you wanna have some exposure to growth, especially in this economy, 
is because, well, our economy is not projected to grow as fast over the next decade and couple of decades as it has in the previous decades and the previous generations. It's because our economy is so much larger now. Back in the day, in our parents and our grandparents' generation, we saw our economy grow by five, six, seven, eight, even nine percent a year. But nowadays, we're just trying to see our economy grow by 2% a year. So our economy, because it's so large, and our country, because it's so large, can't grow as fast as it did before. I mean, when you're a smaller company, it's not uncommon to see your company grow by 20 or 40 or even 100% in a year because you're small and you have the opportunity to gain a lot more market share and you can grow a lot faster. But if you're investing in just the biggest companies, well, you're going to be limited by how fast the economy can grow unless you're really investing in innovation. But if you're already so large, you don't really have the real need to be innovating and creating new products and trying to grow as big as possible, as fast as possible versus with the growth companies and the growth stocks. These are the companies that are fighting, that are competing and that are trying to get more market share. So these are the smaller companies that are trying to go faster, but that also means more risk because now that means that these companies also have a bigger chance of failing and not succeeding. So in Instead of now you trying to find the right companies to invest in on the growth stage, you can invest in an ETF that will give you exposure to this type of growth. But again, you're going to want to pay attention to these three questions because what you're going to see is that the ETFs that I'm going to go over here are very different than the ETFs that we just talked about that give you exposure to the S&P 500. Now, some of these ETFs are very different from the others, so let's go over them. VB is the Vanguard Small Cap ETF. So this is an ETF that gives you exposure to small cap, smaller capitalization, smaller companies, and you're trying to get more growth here because you're investing in smaller companies that are trying to grow bigger. ARKK is going to be the only actively managed ETF. So this is an ETF that gives you exposure to innovation and is actively managed, not passively managed by a computer. Like the other ETFs that I just talked about is managed by someone named Kathy Wood and her team. She's kind of like a celebrity trader slash investor now. And this is an ETF that gives the exposure to more innovation and innovation type of companies. VUG is another Vanguard ETF. This is an ETF that gives you exposure to growth. This is the Vanguard growth ETF. And this is investing in companies that are trying to grow bigger, faster. And then you have QQQ. This is the Invesco ETF that gives you exposure to the NASDAQ. And this is giving you exposure to the 100 companies, 100 biggest companies that are not financial. And so what that means technically is for most of these companies, they are tech companies because the biggest 100 companies on the stock market that are not financial tend to be tech. They don't have to be tech, but most of them tend to be tech because besides financial, the next biggest industry of companies are typically in the tech space. And so QQQ gives exposure to the biggest 100 companies that are not financial. Now, before we get into the questions, got to give you my disclaimer that I do own some shares of the ARK fund. So when we talk about who made these ETFs, this is Vanguard. This is Vanguard. This was ARK by Kathy Wood. And this is Invesco. All of these are very credible investment companies. And to see how much assets they have, let's look into each of their websites. So starting with VB, the small cap ETF on the Vanguard website, it says that they have $141 billion in assets under management. On the ARK, ARKK one, it says they have 21,000 million assets under management, which is 21 billion assets under management. The VUG Vanguard Growth ETF has 183 billion assets under management. And QQQ, I'm going to show you this on the finance.yahoo website because it's easier to find here than on their actual Invesco website. But if you look under the net assets number, it says that they have $192 billion in assets under management. So for all four of these, we know that they're made by all credible companies and they all have billions of dollars in assets under management, which is significantly higher than the bare minimum of at least $100 million in assets under management. So we're looking good over here, which brings me here. What do they actually invest in? So starting up here with VB. Remember, VB is an ETF that gives the exposure to small cap companies. By definition, a small cap company is a company that's worth less than $2 billion. So now coming back to the Vanguard website, you'll see that the 10 largest holdings are things like the Biotechnic Corp or Pool Corp or Diamondback Energy. Unlike the companies in the S&P 500 ETFs, which are worth hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, those were companies that everyone has heard of. There's 
there's a good chance that you haven't heard of any of these companies because they're small cap and these companies are trying to grow. You can compare that to something like ARK, A-R-K-K, which is investing in innovation. Here, this has a very different philosophy where Kathy Wood and her team are trying to invest in innovative companies actively and they're trying to capture the upside that these innovative companies might have in the future, but it also comes with more risk and more volatility. Take a look. ARK's number one holding is Tesla. Then their other top holdings are Coinbase and Roku and Zoom and Shopify. Compared to the other passive ETFs, you'll see a lot more changes in the top holdings for ARK because it's actively managed. And so you'll see them change, which is a top holding. They'll buy and sell stocks a lot more often than these because all the other passively managed ETFs are just letting a computer do its thing. VUG is investing in growth companies, but more specifically, large cap growth companies. So this is investing in companies that have a market cap of over $10 billion. That's the definition of a large cap company. It's worth more than $10 billion compared to here. This is only investing in small cap companies. VUG's top holdings are companies like Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, and Meta, which used to be Facebook. And then you have QQQ investing in the NASDAQ, which are the non-financial companies, and their top holdings are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, and Tesla. This is from Yahoo Finance. So VB is investing in the small cap companies, the smaller companies. This is investing in the large cap growth companies. This is investing in the NASDAQ, the non-financial companies, and this is investing in innovation. Now that we know what these ETFs are investing in, you gotta understand the fees. Going back to the websites, V B's expense ratio is 0.05%, so essentially nothing. ARC's expense ratio is 0.75%, which is a lot higher than the others. VUG's expense ratio is 0.04%, and QQQ's expense ratio is 0.2%. So again, for these passively managed ETFs, the fees are pretty negligible because you're not paying for a person to actively manage and buy and sell the stocks, versus here you can see ARC's expense ratio is significantly higher than all the others. The reason being that this is an actively managed fund and because of that you're paying a higher expense ratio and your goal here is to beat the returns of the market but again you're going to see a lot more volatility here. Some years you're going to see great returns. Other years you're going to see much lower returns. You might lose money and so each one of these has its own fair share of risk and you got to understand what your goal is before you go and invest your money into any of these ETFs. So now we talked about ETFs that gave you exposure to the general economy and the general stock market. The S&P 500 ETF. This is an ETF. The growth ETFs are ETFs that gave you exposure to growth and more innovation and more upside because now you're investing in companies that are smaller trying to acquire more market share. And then I have one more type of ETF that you want to consider buying. That way you can grow and compound your wealth. The third kind of ETF that I want you to consider investing your money in to grow and compound your wealth are emerging market ETFs. These are ETFs that invest in companies overseas and outside of the United States. That way now you can get exposure not just in different companies, but different countries around the world. That way now if the United States economy slows down or if the United States dollar has issues or something happens to the United States, you're not out of luck completely because now you're investing in countries outside of the United States that have their own economies, their own governments, their own systems, and now you're getting exposure to something completely outside of the United States. Now again, this also has its own fair share of risks because a lot of these countries, especially the emerging markets, might not have as much stability as the United States. But the whole idea here is you're investing in a growing country. So if this country can grow a whole lot bigger, their economy can grow a whole lot bigger, and you're invested in a strong company, but now this company can see a whole lot more up side because the whole country and the whole economy there is starting to grow. And yeah, the risk is that some of these emerging markets like China rely on the United States to spend a lot of money in that country. But if these countries continue to grow, now you're also getting exposure to different countries and different economies, which is something important for you to consider because you have a lot of countries and a lot of economies outside the United States that are growing significantly faster than the United States economy just because the United States economy is so large. It just can't grow as fast as it used to. And so these emerging market ETFs gave you exposure to that. Now, before I go into the specific emerging market ETFs, one thing that I do want to mention is that no matter which ETFs that you're investing in, the key for any ETF strategy to work is you have to keep consistently investing your money in ETFs and you want to do this automatically this way every week or every month money is automatically leaving your account and going into these ETFs and this is something that you want to keep doing whether the market is up or down. The key for this to work is you have to be consistent. You don't want to just put your money in once and just forget about it. You want to keep putting your money in and letting your shares in this ETF grow because now you're just getting exposure to the different markets, the different stocks, the different companies and you're just going to keep acquiring shares 
years and let the companies do their thing. And I forgot to mention this just a second ago, but the last key to really make this passive investing strategy work is you have to give it time. The key for this to work is you have to invest your money consistently, passively, and let your money grow and compound, which means you're just gonna let your money sit there and continue growing and building on top of it because your investments need time to appreciate. So a few different emerging market ETFs that you may wanna consider looking at are VWO. This is a Vanguard emerging market ETF. EEM, this is an iShares Emerging Market ETF, and SCHE, this is a Schwab Emerging Market ETF. Now again, disclaimer, I have my own money invested in VWO and SCHE. So now let's dissect and analyze these three ETFs. The first thing is who made it. We have Vanguard, we have iShares, and we have Schwab. All of them are again, very reputable and very credible companies that made these ETFs. So let's go a little bit deeper and see the assets under management. Starting with VWO, it says that the fund total net assets are $110 billion. Moving on to SCHE. E, the Schwab ETF, it says that the total net assets are $9 billion. And then the iShares EEM Emerging Market Fund says that the net assets are $28 billion. So again, each one of them passed this test. It's a credible company and they have a large number of assets under management, each one in the multiple billions. The second question, which is even more important here, is what do they invest in? Now, not only are you looking at the companies, but also what kind of company and which countries are these ETFs investing in? See, it's one thing to be investing into a small cap company in the United States. You know that the United States economy is stable, so when you're investing in a small cap company in the United States, it has its own fair share of risk. You're just hoping that this company, which is small, will be able to grow in the stable economy. But now when you look at these emerging markets, now these economies and governments aren't always as stable as the United States, depending on which country that you're investing in. And so a small cap company in an emerging market might have a much harder time growing, or it'll have the possibility to grow significantly larger, depending depending on which country it's in. So this is where you have to be a little bit more picky and know really what your risk tolerance is because a small cap company in an emerging market is riskier than an investment in a small cap company in the United States just because of the stability of the economy. This is where you have to know your risk tolerance and you gotta know why you're investing your money. Are you looking to invest your money into emerging markets just to get some diversification in your portfolio? Or are you looking at investing in emerging markets that way you can see a whole bunch of potential upside by investing in these growth companies in emerging markets which could try to take over and become a leading company worldwide starting an emerging market. So let me start by analyzing VWO, the Vanguard Emerging Market Fund. If you scroll down onto the Vanguard page, you'll see the portfolio composition and you'll see that 99.5% of this ETF is investing in emerging markets, 0.4% is in Europe, and 0.1% is other. And you can look at some of the largest holdings. The number one holding is the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, number two is Tencent, number three is Alibaba, and on and on and on, but you also want to take a look at the countries that it's invested in. So if you come back up and click on the portfolio and management tab, and then you scroll down, you'll see the market allocation of the top countries that it invests in. So the top five countries that this ETF invests in are China, followed by Taiwan, followed by India, Brazil, and South Africa. Now I want to remind you that with these type of emerging market ETFs, your risks are different than with just investing your money in a US company. And so now you can see bigger swings in these ETFs and in these companies than you would typically see in a US company. VWO has investments in over 5,000 companies and they can compare that to EEM which has investments to about 800 or so companies and these are companies which are large or mid cap companies in emerging markets. So if we come down to the holding section in this ETF you're going to see that its top holdings are actually similar to the Vanguard fund. The number one in this is the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, then you have Tencent, then you have Samsung, then you have Alibaba. And then if you scroll down a little bit further Further, you'll see the exposure breakdowns and then if you click the geography tab you'll see the top countries that this ETF invests in. So the top countries for this ETF are number one China, then Taiwan, then South Korea, then India, then Brazil. So you can start to see why this question is so important here because yeah they do have some similar companies that they invest in and some similar countries but they do have different countries meaning different companies that they also invest in and this brings us here to the Schwab ETF. So similarly, the Schwab ETF is investing in large and mid cap companies in emerging markets. It's investing in about 20 or so countries overseas, and we can take a look at some of its top holdings. Under the portfolio tab, you can see the top holdings, which are for here, the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, you have Tencent, again, Alibaba, again, and then you have companies like Meituan, I think that's how you say it, and Reliance. And then scrolling down to the countries, you'll see that the top countries that this ETF invests in are China, Taiwan, India, Brazil, and 
and South Africa. And now that you know where these ETFs are making their investments, you got to understand the fees. That way you know that you're not overpaying in fees to invest in some countries or companies. So starting with the Vanguard VWO ETF, the expense ratio is 0.1%. Then the iShares EEM ETF, the expense ratio is 0.7%. And then you have the Schwab SCHE ETF, which has an expense ratio of 0.11%. So comparatively, this and this ETF have significantly lower expense ratios than this ETF. So you just gotta do your research and see if this expense ratio is worth it for you if you want to invest in emerging markets. So there's three different ways of investing, growing, and compounding your money. The first is by investing your money into the S&P 500, which gives you general exposure to the economy and the stock market. Then we have the growth stocks. These are the companies that are fighting to grow bigger, and these are a little bit riskier, but you have a lot more upside with your growth stocks if these growth ETFs can grow bigger and the companies within those ETFs can acquire more market share. And then we have the emerging markets. Not only here is it a hedge against the United States, but it's also a way for you to see more potential upside, again, more potential risk here, because you have countries around the world that are trying to grow a lot bigger. They have a lot more potential upside, which means the companies which are innovating and growing within those countries also have the potential for more upside. But the key, again, for any of this to work is you have to keep consistently investing your money. You have to automatically invest your money and you want to make sure that you let your money invest and grow and compound over time because this is a long-term play. These are not trading strategies. This is a way for you to build wealth and continually keep investing your money and slowly let your money grow and compound over time. We're going to jump back into the show in just a minute, but first, here's an advertisement from our sponsor, me with Briefs Media. If you're looking for an easy way to stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news, we make it super easy for you to do that at Briefs Media because we created a free newsletter called Market Briefs. Market Briefs is a super simple and easy way for you to stay up to date on the top finance and business news. You can read Market Briefs in less than five minutes every morning. It's a fun and witty and easy to read newsletter. And I promise if you join Market Briefs, you are going to love it. Now you might say, just breathe. how can you promise that I'm going to love Market Briefs? Well, if you don't love Market Briefs, you can unsubscribe at any time because it's completely free. So if you have not joined Market Briefs yet and you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news, I got the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. Or you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And with that, let's go back to the show. I was on a podcast here in London recently where the host really pressed me on one question. How does somebody break out of this rat race where if somebody, let's assume they're not making a lot of money, they're living small, but even though they're living small, they don't have much money or any money left over at the end of the month. Maybe they have to live paycheck to paycheck. Maybe they have to live on their credit cards. Maybe they have to live on payday loans in order to get by. How does this person break out of the system? How does this person get out of this rat race and how can they become wealthy? because it is possible. And the way that I outlined it is there are seven steps. If you follow these steps one by one by one, you can break out of this system and become wealthy regardless of where you are today in your finances, even if you're living paycheck to paycheck, even if you feel like you're not making enough money, even if you feel like you have no idea what to do with your money, there are strategies that you can follow. Yes, there are strategies because there's a system to this that if you do these steps, step by step, you will have the tools you need in order to become wealthy. But here's the key. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next month. It's probably not going to happen in one year either. This is a long-term wealth game. But if you stick with these strategies, you will be able to completely turn your life around in the next few years and you will be able to achieve that real wealth for yourself. You won't have to worry about how you're going to make your next month's bills. You're not going to have to worry so much about how you're going to eat next week. You're going to actually have that cushion so you can live financially free. And it starts with number one, understanding, realizing, and believing that you have a choice. Now, this one might not seem that important, but this one is so important because if you do not achieve this basic mindset trait, you will never be able to do anything else. You have to believe that you can achieve and change this. Because if you don't believe that you can do it, I guarantee you will not be able to do it. You have to believe and actually want to get out of the system. Now, nobody wants to be broke. Nobody wants to struggle with money. Nobody wants to wonder about how they're going to make the next month's payments. But a lot of people don't want to do the work or make the sacrifices or go through the systems to actually make the change. And so if you don't want to be in that financial situation, you have to also understand and believe and accept 
that you can break out of the system, that you have a choice, that the choice is in your hands. And that means you have to start taking responsibility. And this is hard because that means you can no longer blame your boss. You can no longer blame the government. You can no longer blame the banks. You can no longer blame your landlord. You can no longer blame everybody else. The only person you can blame from now on is you. For the situation that you're in, you have to blame you. No matter how crappy that situation is, no matter how unreasonable this might seem, no matter how weird this might seem, if you start taking that responsibility for yourself, you're going to start changing the things that you do. And if you start changing the things that you do, especially with your money, you're going to end up in a completely different financial situation. And if you don't believe me, try it. Try this with me for the next 30 days. Do not blame anybody else except yourself for anything that happens wrong in your life, for anything that happens difficultly in your life. Blame yourself only. Try for 30 days and see what happens with it. But if you believe that you can make a choice, that's where you can move on to number two. The second thing that you have to do is not give up. And this is an emotional trait that you have to master. The first thing that we talked about was the mindset. Now we're talking about the emotional side. And after this, we're going to get into the practical side. But on this emotional side, you have to not give up. Because what happens, and I've seen this so many times, I've talked about it on this channel too, is a lot of times people get into a situation and they'll say, you know what? Life is short. You know what? I don't know how much time I have. You know what? Might as well be happy. You know what? It's just money. You know what? I don't want to wait until I'm old to be able to enjoy my money. We create this like excuse to just go out and do whatever we want with our money and not care about money anymore. But the reality is, this is an emotional part. You have to care about money. You're already in financial crap right now. And if you're in financial crap right now, why would you want to stop in the middle of the crap? Keep going until you get out. Because what happens to a lot of people is they're in this crap. They don't see a way out. You feel like you're struggling with money. You feel like everything sucks with money. You can't figure out how to get out. So what do you do? You know what? I'm just going to go finance a $10,000 vacation to the Bahamas. I'm going to go on this crazy trip. I'm going to go buy some nice things. I'm going to go finance a nice car because I don't know how I'm going to get out. Might as well just enjoy my life however I can best. The problem with that is these things are going to catch up to you. And now instead of being into a knee-high pile of crap, now you're going to end up in a shoulder-high pile of crap. Eventually, you're not going to be able to breathe, and it will get worse because all these things do catch up to you. Money does matter. As much as people want to talk about how it doesn't matter, the reality is money does matter. And the reason why it matters is because it costs money to eat, and it also costs money to feed other people. You need money in order to be able to not just survive, but also to be able to thrive. You need money to be able to take care of other people. You need money to be able to buy the thing for your wife that you want. You need money to take care of your husband. You need money to buy your college for your kids. You need money to pay for the vacation. You need money to pay for your savings. You need money to buy a home. It costs money to survive. We go to work every single day to get a paycheck. You're going to work to get paid. And so this is where it is important for you to understand money does matter. This doesn't mean you got to be obsessed with this idea of money and just be this money hungry, money greedy, just just money thirsty person. But it means you have to understand that money is important and you can change this, but you do not want to give up. Because if you're in the crap right now, it can be very hard for you to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But if you're in the crap, that is not the time to stop. Do not stop in the crap. Keep working to get out. Do not stop where you are right now. The third thing that you need to do, and points three through seven are practical things that you need to start doing with your money. Number one is your mindset. Number two is the emotions. Number three is the practical side of now you got to cut back on your spending. And this one gets difficult because you might feel like you're already living small. I'm already financing a small car. I'm already living in a small apartment. I'm already not really eating out. I'm already not really going on vacations. But I can guarantee you there are ways for you to find an additional 50 to 100 bucks a month by cutting back on some things. Maybe you stop eating out at certain restaurants. Maybe you buy different foods at the grocery store. Maybe you do need to find a different apartment. Maybe you got to sell your car and downsize. If you have a finance car, if you have a finance BMW, if you have a car that takes premium gas, I guarantee you there are ways for you to downsize. There's always a way for you to cut back on your spending. And you do not want to get into this game of just penny pinching for the rest of your life because at the end of the day, a penny saved is just a penny. But that is the first practical step to actually breaking out of this financial system and breaking out of this financial mess is you have to control the spending because the fastest way, the most accessible way for you to have more money 
is just to not let your money leave your bank account. And that means you got to start safeguarding this money that's in your account, which means you got to stop letting this money leave your account. That means you got to stop spending your money. And this is where you got to remember, every time you spend a dollar, somebody else is making your dollar. And so what I want you to do right now is stop making everybody else rich and save that money for yourself. Now, the goal isn't to save it forever, but you got to start with this. You got to start by finding some extra cash. You got to make some money and spend less than what you bring in. Because if you cannot do that, you will never, ever become wealthy. I don't care how much money you're making. Because what will happen is you're going to make more money and then you're going to end up spending more money and then have a bigger financial liability, have bigger financial problems and end up in a bigger financial hole. So you have to start this here is you got to control the spending. There are ways for you to cut back, maybe negotiate some of your bills lower, maybe cancel some of your memberships, maybe stop spending money on things, figure out ways that you can cut back on spending every single person can find a way to find at least 50 to 100 bucks a month that you no longer have to spend. The fourth thing that you need to do is you got to take this money that you're no longer spending and need to put it to work. Now, the way that you put it to work is going to depend on where you are in your financial goal. Maybe you have no savings, no investments, nothing. Then you got to start by saving your first couple thousand dollars. If you already got some savings, but you got credit card debt, then you got to work to pay down your credit card debt as fast as possible. You got to pay down the high interest debts. If you don't have any credit card debts and you have a little bit of savings, but you have no investments, that means you got to start putting your money to work in your investments. See, the way that you put your money to work is going to depend on where you are. If you have credit card debt, you shouldn't be worrying about investing your money into the stock market, right? The stock market is going to get you a five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine, maybe 10% return on your money. That is the goal. But you can also lose your money in the stock market, right? It's not guaranteed. Your credit card is costing you 15, 16, 17, 20, 25% a year in interest. So if you might be able to get a 10% return in the stock market, but you're going to pay 25% on your credit card, you're going to get a better return by paying off your credit card one year early. So the way that you put your money to work now, the way that you invest your money is going to depend on where you are. Maybe you don't have any credit card debt. Maybe you have some savings, but you don't know how to invest. Maybe you got to invest this money in your own education. Maybe that means buying books. Maybe that means buying classes. Maybe that means buying coaching. There's a lot of different ways that you can invest this money. And I'm not going to do a full deep dive of how do you invest your money in this video because I have many videos on my channel where I talk about that. And we also have a free ebook at Briefs Media where we go over how to build wealth as an investor. That's the title of the ebook, which goes over things like how do you spend your money? How do you invest your money? What are the different ways that you can invest your money? How do you generate cash flow? How do you see appreciation? How do you protect your assets? This is a very comprehensive ebook that you can read for free. If you want to download a copy of this ebook and start reading for free, I got the link for you down in the description below. Or you go to briefs.co slash ebook. But this is where now what you have to remember is you are not spending all of your money because now you're saving some money and you want to take this money and put it to work. Meaning you want to put it to work to start building your wealth. Maybe that means paying down your debt. Maybe that means building some savings. Maybe that means now you're going to go out and grow this money. You got to do all three, but the way that you do it is going to depend on where you are in your financial situation. So now if you're following the steps, you started by conquering the mindset. Then you started by conquering your emotional side of money. Then you started by conquering the way you spend your money. Then you conquered the investing side of how you put your money to work once you start having some extra cash. Then this is where I want you to work on actually earning more money. Because what you'll see is if you feel like you're not making enough money, there's only so much that you can cut back. Maybe you can find an additional 100 bucks a month. Maybe an additional 200 bucks a month. Maybe an additional $500 a month. Maybe, depending on if you're making a little bit more, $1,000 a month. But there's always going to be a limit to how much you can cut back. But there's no limit to how much you can earn. And this is where now, at this stage, I want you to start putting in the focus on earning more money. But the reason why you're earning more money is not so you can go out and have a nicer car, a bigger home, better vacations, more fancy stuff. The reason I want you to earn more money now is so you have more money to put to work, whether that's paying down your credit card debt, whether that's building your savings or investing your money. Because now the goal is to build your wealth. Remember, every time you spend a dollar, you're making somebody else rich. You're giving that dollar to somebody else. I want you to use your dollars to make yourself rich first. So now the question is, how do you earn more money? And this is, again, going to depend on who you are and where you are. If you got a job and you have the opportunity to work some extra hours, use that opportunity to earn some extra money. 
If you can take on a second job, use that opportunity to take on a second job. If you start a side hustle, can start a side hustle, use this opportunity to start a side hustle. If you want to start a business, use this opportunity to start a business. There's no limit to the different ways that you can earn more money, but you got to actually put in the work. And the interesting thing is when I talk about this, I get a lot of interesting feedback of people saying, oh, you just want people to work and work and work. And the reality is you're never going to get anywhere in life without working. If you are a lazy person, I suggest you just leave this video now because you can't get anywhere you want without actually putting in some effort, without actually making some sacrifice and putting in the work. Because now the reason why you're working more isn't just so you can have a nicer car. Because see, what happens so, to so many people is they're working to make other people rich. I mean, most people hear that, they think, oh, that's because you're working for somebody else, you're making your boss rich. But that's not what I mean. I mean, you're working to make somebody else rich because all you're doing is you're working to buy nice things. It's not because you're working in a company. Everybody works in a company. I have my own company, but guess what? I'm an employee in my own company. I get a salary out of it. Now, if you want to start your own business, fine. But what I'm trying to say is if you take that salary that you're earning and you use this just to make everybody else rich by going out and shopping, every time you get paid, you're never going to have the ability to build wealth because all of your money is immediately going out. So now, as you're working to earn more money, the question is why are you working to earn more money? You're working to earn more money. That way you have more money to actually build your wealth. You have more money to put to work. That way you can become wealthy. How do you earn more money? Maybe you get a second job. You work more hours at your job. You get a side hustle. You start a business. Number six is you need to turn your Netflix time into learning time. This one is difficult because now you've done all the practical things right with your money. You're working hard. You're spending less. You're putting your money to work. You're working to earn more money. And now you come home to finally relax and watch some TV and you just want to chill. The problem here is if Every night, you're spending two hours just chilling. Well, you're going to be able to grow a whole lot slower than if you use that time to learn. And what I want you to remember here is the goal isn't to work yourself to death for the rest of your life. But when a sacrifice needs to be made, you got to be willing to make that sacrifice. And that's the thing that will really differentiate somebody who becomes successful versus somebody who doesn't is the person who is willing to make the sacrifice when it needs to be made will see the results that somebody who doesn't or won't doesn't see. And this is where now, if you really want to accelerate your path, you want to now turn your Netflix time into learning time. The average American is watching almost three hours of TV a day. A day. If you turn the Netflix time into reading time, you start reading books or you start watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts on things like how do you build a business? How do you increase your income? How do you grow in your career? How do you get a new career? How do you invest your money? How do you put your money to work? How do you pay down your debt? You're going to be in a completely different mindset in six months and you're going to be in a completely different financial situation in two years. Two years might seem like a long time, but building wealth is a lifetime game. I call it a decade of sacrifice. And the reason why I call it a decade of sacrifice is because if you put in the work for 10 years, which is a long time, you are going to be in a completely different financial situation where now you can use the money that your money is making to live your life. But most people don't want to put in the work for a decade. But this is where now I want you to remember, some people will be able to achieve this success. Some people won't be willing to do it. If you want to achieve the success, you got to do what you got to do in order to get there. And that means you have to work to use your money smartly, and you got to also use your time smartly. And one of the things that you can do is convert the Netflix time into learning time. That is the best ROI that you can get. Not because you're going to save 15 bucks a month, but because you're going to save those two to three hours a day where now you can use that time to read books, listen to podcasts, watch YouTube videos. If you do that, you're going to be in a completely different situation in six months. You're going to think completely differently in six months, and you're going to be in a completely different financial situation in two years. And this brings us to number seven, which is use your new money. Now, if you remember, how do we get here? Number one is you got to change the way you think with your mindset. Number two is you got to master the emotional side of your money. Number three is you got to master the spending side of your money. Number four is you got to put the money to work. Number five is you got to work to earn more money. Number six, you have to master what you do with your time. And number seven, this is where you get to start to finally use the fruits of your labor. Because what you'll start to see happen is you will first change the way you think. 
Then as you change the way you think, you start to change the way you spend your money and you start to see some extra cash and then you start to invest that money. Then what you'll see is, wow, this investing thing is kind of cool. I wish I had more money to invest so you were to earn more money. And then as you were to earn more money, you're going to keep working to change your mindset and now you realize, wow, if I had more knowledge, I could earn more money as well. And this is where now you start investing more money and time into learning. As you spend more money and time learning, you find more ways to earn. Then, as you earn more, you put more money towards your investments. And then, as you start putting more money towards your investments, one day you're going to wake up and realize, wow, I actually have savings. I've paid down my high interest debts. I have a whole new income stream for my investments. And now that you have started to build this wealth, now you can start to change the way that you live your life as well. Because the goal isn't to live small forever. I want you to have all the nice things. I want you to have the nice car the nice home, the nice vacations. The problem is I don't want you to be the person that's going into debt to fund these things. I don't want you to spend all of your money to have a nice vacation. I want you to be able to afford these things without worrying about the price. And if you can start making money through your money, right? This is money that your money's making. It's not money that you're working hard to generate. When you're working in somebody else's business, you're working hard to earn that money. When you're working to earn money from your own business, you're working hard to earn that money. But when the money comes from your investments that are sitting there just paying you every month or every few months or every year, that's not money you're working hard to earn. You worked hard to buy the investments, but then your investments are working hard to pay you. Now when you start getting this new income, now you can start making the decision of what do you want to do. Do you want to reinvest that money or do you want to start using that money to start living a little bit bigger? And that decision is going to be up to you. Maybe if you still got some more gas in you, you keep putting the money to work. That way you can accelerate this, this compounding game and keep growing your income and wealth even faster. If now you say, you know what, I think this is the time I want to get a new car. I want my investments to pay for my car. Well, now you have a way to do that. But the key is you have to go through this step by step. You got to be willing to make the sacrifices. Keep putting in the hard work because it is hard, especially when you don't see that light at the end of the tunnel, but you don't want to stop when you're in the crap. That's when you want to keep going. That way you can get out of the crap. And remember, money does matter, but you have to be strategic with the way that you're going to use and systemize your money because if you have a system then you'll have a process to build wealth but you got to remember this is not a six month thing this is a 10 year game plan we're talking about a decade of sacrifice but if you're willing to do it for a decade you're going to end up in a whole new different place financially you can set yourself up for the rest of your life and you can even start setting up your kids for the rest of their lives because now you're building a wealthy mindset and for those of you who say well i want to start enjoying my life now Well, that decade is going to go by whether you like it or you don't, whether you're being financially smart or you're not. And I'd rather you see that decade go by and be in a better situation financially than stay broke and then continue to be broke a decade from now as well. Now, again, if you want to learn more about how do you build wealth and put this money to work, we have a free ebook at Briefs Media. I got the link for you down in the description. We have other videos on my channel where we go over how do you actually invest your money as well. Everyone makes it seem like becoming a millionaire is so easy. Just put $100 a month into the stock market and retire a millionaire. Except there's more to it than that. I'll show you. If you want to be a millionaire investor, you need to know how to get started. Put it all in Tesla! And YOLOing your money is not the right strategy. If you want to increase your chances of becoming a millionaire, there's an order of operations of how you need to go about investing your money into the stock market that I want to go over with you. The first thing you got to do is not just throw your money in the stock market, is to build some savings cushion. The second thing that you have to do before you put money in the stock market is you got to pay down your high interest debts because you're going to get a better return here. The third thing that you need to do is you got to prepare to invest your money. I'll go over what that means. The fourth thing that you got to do is you got to build your investing strategy. This is a mistake that so many people make is that they start investing their money with no idea of how they're actually going to make money. We'll go over how to build your strategy. And then the fifth thing that you want to do is execute on your strategy and actually stick with your strategy. So let me go over these five things step by step. That way you understand understand how you can become a successful investor and even a millionaire investor in the stock market. So let me start by talking about number one, having the right savings. There's a difference between having investment money, which is going to make you rich. And there's a difference between having savings money, which is there to protect you against an emergency. If you do not have 
$2,000 saved up right now in a bank account that's there to protect you against an emergency. This is not cash that you want to use to go out and buy a TV, buy a home, buy a car. This is $2,000 saved up just to protect you against an emergency. Before you think about investing your money in the stock market, I want you to go out and save $2,000 as fast as possible. And the reason why is you don't want to use your stock market money as an emergency savings fund in case something goes wrong. Because let's just say your kid breaks their arm and now you need a few thousand dollars to cover this expense for whatever reasons. If you don't have this cash in your savings account, but you have this money in the stock market and you don't want to put it on your credit card, well now you might be forced to sell your stocks at a bad time. You might be forced to sell your stocks in the middle of a market crash. You might be forced to sell your stocks when you don't want to sell and now you're liquidating your stocks, you're liquidating your lifetime investments, you're liquidating your retirement account just to pay off this expense. And that's why the first thing you need to do is you got to save $2,000 as an emergency fund. And this is where I want you to remember is you want to ideally have three different bank accounts. One bank account to hold your spending money, one bank account to hold your investing money, and one bank account to hold your savings money. Now, of course, your investing money needs to be invested, but depending on what your strategy is, sometimes you might need this money just sitting there on the side waiting to be invested versus some of you are going to have this money automatically invested. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this video, but this is where you want to understand this difference between your savings to protect you and this is the difference between your investments and you got to have this before you start investing. The second thing that you want to do before you invest your money in the stock market is pay down any high interest debts and let me show you why. Let's do a little math problem. According to Forbes, at the time of me recording this video, the average credit card interest rate is right around 27%. And then according to Investopedia, the average historical stock market return over the last century is about 10% a year. So now if we do a little bit of math, what you'll see is that the average stock market return is a whole lot lower than the average credit card debt, which means from a math perspective, you are going to get a better return by paying this down before you start putting your money here. And not to mention that this has a guaranteed return. If you can pay your credit card off one year early, that's a guaranteed 20, 25, 27% return because you paid off your credit card debt early. Versus when you put your money into the stock market, well, remember, this is an average. Sometimes the stock market will grow more than this. Sometimes the stock market will grow less than this. And sometimes the stock market will shrink. So when you put your money into the stock market, there's no guarantee of you even making money or how much money you're going to make next year. Versus when you pay down your high interest debts, like your credit card debt or your payday loans, you're getting a guaranteed return, which is why before you start worrying about putting your money in the stock market, be aggressive in paying this off ASAP. Once you do the foundational stuff of saving your first $2,000 at the very least, and then you work to pay down your high interest debts, now this is where you can actually start preparing to actually invest your money into the stock market. This is where things get fun. This is where now you can start building the mindset of an investor. This is where number two, understanding that you want to be investing your money for the long term. Number three, understand that, well, there's a chance that you could lose money and you don't want to invest more than you're willing to lose. And number four is you got to understand the risks involved with investing as well and make sure that you are ready to handle those risks and seeing the market potentially crash. So when it comes to building the mindset of an investor, what you'll see is that these first two kind of go hand in hand. As an investor, what you need to remember is that wealth goes to those who are disciplined and to those who are patient. Warren Buffett likes to say that the stock market is a device that transfers money from the impatient to the patient because the impatient are trying to chase stocks. They get excited about what's happening in the news. They hear about this new hot stock and they throw the money in there thinking that they're going to get rich because everybody else is getting rich from it. But when you play that game, well, you're going to be the person that's making everybody else rich because what ends up happening is you buy when things are going up and then when things start to go down, that's when you panic and that's when you sell. We don't want to do that. So you want to build a mindset of understanding that this is not the game that you want to play. You're not trying to just chase what everybody else is doing. You're going to have your own strategy and you need to be able to cut through the noise and not fall into those same traps. Number two is you want to be a long-term investor, which means that now we're not talking about trading stocks. We're not talking about buying something and holding it for six months. We're talking about buying something and holding it for the long term, maybe even forever depending on what your strategy is, where now you're looking to buy investments that you believe in for the long term. That way you can build long term wealth because the most wealth is built from the long term investing, not from the trading. Traders can make a lot of money in the short term, but then they can lose that money just as fast. We're talking about how do you build long term sustainable wealth because that's how wealth is actually built. And then understanding that 
you don't want to invest more than you're willing to lose. Sometimes people get excited about investing the money in the stock market, especially if you get started investing during a bull market, meaning when markets are going up. People can get very excited. If you put your money into a good stock and you see your money grow by 20% very quickly, now you get excited. And you think, wow, what if I just use some margin or some leverage or some debt? Now I can make even more money. Or you take money that you can't afford to lose and you put it into the markets because you think you're a genius investor because of what you did in the last six months. But this is where I want you to remember. You don't want your emotions to get the best of you. You don't want to invest more than you're willing to lose because markets go up and markets go down. Your goal is to make money over the long term, but you don't want to take that risk with money that you can't afford to lose and understand that more margin means more risks. And especially if you're a beginner investor, please don't even think about touching margin. I don't mess with that stuff. And I don't recommend that to anybody who's just getting started as an investor. You want to be a long-term investor who's understanding how do you actually build wealth in the markets, not trying to play these trading games. And the fourth, understanding that there's risks associated with investing. Look, the stock market goes through booms and busts. This is a part of our economic system. Our stock market crashed in 2020. The stock market crashed during the 2008 crash. The stock market crashed in the year 2000 slash 2001 during the dot-com bubble. Yet, our stock market has still been resilient since then. We know that the United States economy has gone through crap and we will go through more crap in the future. However, even though we've gone through it, we've become stronger each and every time. And this is where you gotta remember that there's booms and busts in the market. Market crashes happen, they have happened and they will continue to happen and in fact, probably get more severe in the future because of the amount of debt out there. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest your money, but this means you have to understand this because when you go through those bust periods, those down periods, there's a a lot of negative sentiment, a lot of negative emotion of people thinking that the world's gonna end. And when you go through the boom periods, there's a lot of excitement and exuberance and just people thinking that nothing could ever go wrong. And this is where you want to be more of that disciplined investor and not get caught up with these emotions and understand that if you have a good strategy, you will be able to weather the storm and you will be able to make even more money assuming you understand that those down periods create opportunity for you to buy even more and the up periods are the time now for you to realize your profits. Now, once you start thinking like an investor, this is where we move on to number four, which is now you build your game plan. You build your strategy of how you're actually gonna invest your money. And there's two general game plans that I like to talk about. One is a passive strategy, one is an active strategy, and you can figure out which one of these or both that you wanna choose. Me personally, I do a little bit of both. So let's talk about both of these, starting with a passive strategy, because this passive system is what I believe most of America. 90 to 98% of America should be doing to build wealth because this active strategy takes a lot more work and a lot more financial education that I don't think most people are actually interested in doing, but if that's something you wanna do, that's fine. I just want you to understand how both of these strategies work. So the passive strategy, the way that it works, is it is an automatic system where every time you get paid, maybe it's every week, maybe it's every two weeks, maybe it's every month, you're gonna have cash be pulled out of your checkings account and it's gonna be automatically invested into your portfolio of funds. This might be ETFs, this might be mutual funds, this might be index funds, and what these funds are is they are groups of stocks because you don't wanna be investing in individual companies like this because when you invest in individual companies with a passive strategy, you're taking on all the risk. So let me give you a little example of this. A couple of decades ago, some of the strongest companies on our stock market and in our economy were companies like Bed Bath & Beyond and Sears. And a couple of decades ago, every financial advisor would have told you that these are strong companies, they're strong innovators, they're category killers, and they're going to be strong investments. Well, if you created a system where your money is consistently going into these companies because now you want these companies to fund your retirement, today you would have nothing. And so this is where now you want to protect yourself against these bankrupt companies if you're gonna be a passive investor by investing in something like a fund. And what a fund is, is now instead of investing in just one company, you're gonna invest in hundreds of companies or thousands of companies, depending on what the fund is, that way now you're protected. If one of the companies in this fund goes bankrupt, well, you have dozens or hundreds, or maybe even thousands of other companies to protect you. So what these funds do is they lower some of the risk. Now, of course, they do lower some of the upside as well, because if you invested your money in Amazon when it was a penny stock, well, you'd be extremely rich today. But that means you have to actually find that Amazon, make that investment and hold on to it, which most people aren't willing to do. So with these types of funds, the index funds, ETFs and mutual funds, you have the opportunity now to lower some of the risk and it does limit some of the upside, but 
You have the ability now to create this type of passive investment where money can automatically be invested into your portfolio of funds. And now you just let the markets do their thing because now you're investing into the market. Now, for example, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you an example. There are funds that give you exposure to the total stock market like VTI. This is an ETF, meaning it's a fund that if you bought one share of this fund, VTI, you'll buy a little bit of every stock on the American stock market. That's what VTI is. There are funds that give you exposure to the s and 500 like SPY. SPY is an ETF that if you buy one share of SPY, you're buying a piece of the S&P 500, which is a group of the largest 500 companies in our stock market. There are funds like DIA, which give you exposure to the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is a group of 30 selected companies in our stock market. You might've heard of people talking about the Dow Jones before. And there are funds like QQQ that give you exposure to the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ 100 is a group of the 100 largest companies that are not financial that are listed on the NASDAQ. So now, instead of you going out and investing in one company, you can invest in funds such as these. Again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, but there are so many funds out there. There are funds that can get you dividends, there can funds that can give you exposure to the stock market, there are funds that can give you exposure to technology or healthcare or emerging markets or innovation. You just gotta figure out what it is that you want to invest in, and then you build this portfolio of funds that you wanna invest in. You figure out what types of funds that you wanna invest in. You list them out here, and then you see how much of every dollar invested you want invested in every fund. Like for example, if you were to invest in these four funds, do you want it to be 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents? Or is it 50 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents, 30 cents? You just figure out how you want your money to be invested and then you turn on the system, you automate it, and then you don't worry about it. This is where now you don't wanna change things when markets go down, except maybe you invest a little bit more aggressively because you understand that market crashes happen and they create opportunities for you to continue buying good investments. The only time you'd really change this is if the fund that you're investing in, the industry that you're investing in, the thing that you're investing in, something is really wrong with that. Now, of course, investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money invest. You might even lose money. In fact, you will lose money at some point, which is why you wanna always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube, but this is a strategy that has the potential to make you wealthy over the long term if you stay consistent with the strategy, the way that I do this. Again, I don't recommend what I do to anybody else is I have a system where every Wednesday, cash leaves my check-ins account and it's invested into my portfolio of ETFs. Now, the largest piece of my portfolio are dividend paying funds because I like to generate cash flow. So now I'm investing my money to buy cash flow. Every time I buy more cash flow, my cash flow is buying me more cash flow. I also invest in funds that give me exposure to value stocks. I also invest in funds that give me exposure to innovation stocks. I also invest in funds that give me exposure to emerging market stocks. So this is where now you gotta kind of figure out what's right for you. Now, if you're watching this and you're wondering how you can find a software or a way to automate these types of investments, there are a ton of different types of softwares out there. Just go to Google, find the right platform for you. I personally use a platform called M1, who is also a sponsor of the Minority Mindset and the sponsor of today's video. So if you wanna invest your money passively into the stock market, the reason why I like M1 is because the way that M1 works is number one, it's free to use, but then you can go and create something called a pie. A pie is your portfolio of different types of funds or stocks that you want to invest in. So now you decide what different types of funds you want to invest in, and then you decide how often you want to invest your money into these funds every week, every two weeks, every month, and then you turn on your system, you automate it, and then you just kind of forget about it. You let the investments do their thing. Now, of course, investing has risks, but this is a way for you to passively invest your money without having to spend a ton of time doing that. So if you'd like to learn more about M1, see how you can passively invest your money, I got the link to how you can do that and learn more down in the description below. Minority Mindset is a paid partner with M1, meaning if you use them, we will get compensated, but there's no additional cost to you. So if you'd like to learn more, I got the link for you down in the description below, or you can go to theminoritymindset.com slash M1. That's theminoritymindset.com slash M1. And the number one, the way active investing works is now you are gonna take money. So now this is money that's gonna be sitting in your account somewhere, maybe your bank account somewhere, maybe a high interest savings account somewhere. You have this cash, and now you're gonna be looking for a good investment opportunity, maybe an undervalued stock. You're looking for some sort of good investment that you believe is gonna give you long-term potential. And now you're gonna be waiting until you find this stock to invest in. And when you find that good time, that good opportunity, that good price, that's when you're gonna go in and buy. But the reason why this takes more work, more financial education, and more patience is because now, number one, you have to know how do you identify 
a good stock to actually invest in. And this is going to require you to invest in your own financial education to understand companies. And the first thing you want to understand now is how do you read financial statements? How do you read a cash flow statement? How do you read a balance sheet? And how do you read an income statement? This does take time and it takes work. What you want to understand is that a cash flow statement shows you how the cash moved through the company. An income statement shows you the profit and loss of a company. This way now you can see, are the profits growing or are they shrinking? Why are the profits shrinking if they're shrinking? If the profits are growing, is it sustainable what they're doing? And then the balance sheet shows you the assets minus liabilities of the company. And this is where you want to take a look at, are the liabilities feasible? Are the liabilities too much for a company this size? Is this a good and healthy run company? Then in addition to that, you want to look at the executives of a company. You want to look at the company structure. You want to look at how they're innovating. You want to look at the general pulse of, do people actually like these products? And will they want these products in the future? And how is this company going to stay competitive in five years and 10 years from now? So you can start to see how this financial education takes much more work, which is why I don't recommend everybody do this. In fact, I don't recommend most people do this. But in addition to that, you also have to have the right psychology as an investor. Because now on the psychology side, you don't want to come in and buy when the stock is overvalued just because you hear everybody else talking about it. You also don't want to go in and sell at the wrong time because everybody's panicking and freaking out. And so you have to know how to manage the psychology of investing with the financial education and understand that this comes with more risk. More risk comes with more potential gain, but it also comes with more risk. And so now you have to understand if you're going to be following the strategy, if you're going to be investing in individual companies, that's completely fine. But understand the risk, understand the strategy, also understand your goals. Because now if you just go in and throw your money into something that you think is the next Tesla or the next Amazon or the next Meta, but you really have no strategy or goals because you're just throwing your money in because you hear people talking about it. Well, how do you know when to sell? How do you know how long you should hold it? How do you know if something's so wrong with the company that you shouldn't keep owning it anymore? And how do you know what you should actually do with the stock if it starts paying you dividends? Now, I'm going to say this one more time. You don't have to pick just this one or just this one. You can kind of do a hybrid, but you have to understand the risks associated with each one of these and understand what your strategy is before you start investing your money. This brings us to number five, execute. This is where you actually put your money to work and now you're going to start following your system. Now, again, you don't want to invest more money than you're willing to lose, but this is where now you want to start actually putting your money to work. And remember, markets go up, markets go down, but you have to be patient if you really want to build wealth over the long term because your goal is to build long-term wealth. Now, what you need to remember here on the execute side is that when things go wrong, because they will go wrong, you have to stay calm. There will be times where you're going to have to pivot. Maybe you have to change your strategy for a little bit. Maybe you have to change what you were investing in because something went wrong. That is a part of the investing game. Every single investor loses money at some point. It is a part of the process. I don't care how smart you are. Every single person loses money at some point. It sucks, but the goal is to make way more than you lose. And now when it comes to this execute strategy, you have to remember that the goal is to make money over the long term. And sometimes things will go wrong. And that's where you have to make calculated decisions as to what you're going to do. Because if markets crash and I just sell out of everything because you're scared, well, that's not a very good calculated decision. But if markets are going down and now you're seeing a big change, if you're investing in individual companies and your company's on the verge of bankruptcy, then yeah, that's something you want to get out of. If you're investing in a fund and something's seriously wrong with the fund, then yeah, maybe you need to get out of that. But if you're investing into something that is strong, but the markets are just getting destroyed because of a market crash, this is where it creates opportunity for you to come in and buy even more. But again, these are the types of decisions you're going to have to make in a calm mind, not in a panicky mind. And then you have to remember that the way that you build wealth is by consistently investing your money. You don't just invest your money once or invest your money for a few months or invest your money for a year. This is something now that you want to be consistently investing your money month after month after month, year after year after year, if you really want to build wealth because wealth is built over the long term. And then you have to understand that if you want to accelerate your path to wealth, you're going to need more money to invest. That means working to now earn more money so you have more money to invest that we can build the wealth sooner rather than later. And these are the types of things now where you want to understand that building this financially fit lifestyle is a lifestyle. It's not something you do for two months or six months or a year. If you really want to build wealth in the stock market, this is something that's going to take time, but you have to actually use the stock market the way that it was intended to use instead of just throwing a little bit of money into a random stock, hoping it's going to double. And then when it doesn't double, you just run away and never invest your money again. 
This is where now you have to understand how wealth building actually works in the stock market. That way you can win in the stock market. Now, it does help for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news. By the way, my team at Briefs Media has a free newsletter called Market Briefs, where we can help you do that. Market Briefs is a free newsletter. I got the link to Market Briefs down in the description, or you can go to briefs.co slash market if you'd like to learn about Market Briefs. But this is where it helps to stay up to date on what's happening, but not get bogged down by the financial news. You want to understand what's happening, that way you can understand the economic factors that are going on so you're less surprised by the crazy things but this is where again the way you build wealth is by investing your money for the long term and sticking with your strategy even when things get tough instead of being the person that just sells out of everything when things go wrong because things will go wrong but you have to know how you can keep your mind calm and make financial decisions not emotional decisions let's talk about investing for cash flow because unfortunately there's a lot of let's call it poo poo information out there on the internet when it comes to the topic of cash flow investing because a lot of people say oh if you want to get rich just get this passive income create this drop shipping site start this amazon store create this ebook and you're going to be making passive income this cash flow but the reality is number one that's not passive and number two it is so difficult to generate this type of cash flow the way that real cash flow investing works for investors and help people become extremely wealthy with cash flow is like this i'm gonna draw you right here for my male followers i'm gonna draw you a mustache and for our female followers i'm gonna draw you a braid in my native language punjabi we call a mustache a much and a braid a gut so now you go to work every single day at this job. Maybe this job is your business, and then this job is gonna pay you a salary. Now you're gonna take a piece of the income that you did not spend at Gucci and Chipotle, and you're gonna take this money, and you're gonna invest it into this asset. Now this asset could be something like a dividend paying stock. It could be something like real estate. I'll talk about how you can do this in just a minute, but now you're gonna take this money, put it into this asset that's gonna be generally passive on your end. Not completely passive, but generally passive. And now that you own this asset, it is going to pay you with cash flow. Maybe you get a check every month. Maybe you get a check every three months. Maybe you get a check once a year. Just depends what this asset is. And now you can take this money that you're generating and you can either buy more of these assets that are gonna pay you with more cash flow, or you can take this money and use it to go out and buy you a brand new car. That's gonna be your choice, but this is how real cash flow investing works. Now, the thing that you need to understand about cash flow investing that nobody wants to talk about on the internet is that you don't get rich by investing for cash flow. You got to be rich first to get a lot of the cash flow that will make you wealthy. The reason why is because you got to take the money that you're earning that you don't spend at Chipotle and Gucci, and then you take this money to buy these assets. So you need the money to generate the cash flow in the first place. And this is why it's so difficult, is because people hear this idea of generating passive income and cash flow, and it sounds very exciting. But the reality is, when you generate this cash flow, you're generating a return on the money that you invest. So let's assume, I'm gonna be very generous here. Let's assume that you can get a 10% cash flow return. That's very high, by the way. But let's assume you can get a 10% cash flow return. That means if you invested $1,000 into this asset, you're gonna generate $100 after one year of cash flow. $100 from $1,000 is not going to really pay you much. I mean, it's not going to fund really anything in your life. Even if you invested $100,000, then you're only generating $10,000 a year. Now, $10,000 a year is a lot, but it's not even $1,000 a month. It's not life-changing money for you to go out and start driving a Rolls Royce. You need the money to invest to generate the cash flow. This is where people say, but Jasprit, if I need millions of dollars to generate a lot of cash flow, What's the point of me even doing that? Well, the point isn't for you to go and invest into this cash flow asset today and never do it again. The point is you go to work every single day. You get this paycheck every week, every two weeks, every month. Every time you get paid, you're gonna take a little bit of this money and buy this asset. Now, when you do this week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year, decade after decade, now you're going to be building a solid stream of cash flow, especially if you're taking this cash flow that you're generating and using it to buy more assets because now you're making money to buy cash flow and the money that your money makes is buying you more cash flow as well. And now if you do this for long enough, now you're going to be able to build a solid stream. Now the more money you invest into this asset, the more cash flow you're going to be able to generate. And this is why I call it the decade of sacrifice. Because if you put in a decade of time, 
where you're working to live smaller so you have more money here, and then you take this money and you use it to buy these assets that are paying you with cash flow. Well now, after a decade of sacrifice, you are gonna be able to reap the rewards of that, which is now you're gonna finally have a solid stream of cash flow. So if you wanna go through this decade of sacrifice, which is not easy, I mean, it's the reason why the majority of people will never become financially successful or wealthy. The majority of people do not want to make this financial sacrifice of you working to live smaller and earn more money, not so you can drive a BMW, not so you can buy all the fancy Gucci, not so you can have a big home, but so you can have more assets. And if you put in that work to own more assets that are paying you with cash flow, now you got the checks coming in every month, every quarter, every year, and now you have this money coming in without you physically working because remember, you gotta work here to get this check. You don't gotta work here to get this check. This asset cash flow is coming in passively. The only thing you gotta do here is make sure that your assets are still good, making sure that you still own a good portfolio of stocks, making sure that your real estate is still good. All you gotta do here is monitor it. Here, you gotta go into the office or go into work and keep getting that paycheck because if you don't work, you don't get that paycheck. Here, if you don't work, you still get paid. But in order to get paid here, you gotta keep contributing money here week after week, month after month, year after year for at least a solid decade. And if you do that, now you're gonna have a brand new stream of income that can allow you to drive the nice car without worrying about the price. You have the money coming in here that will allow you to go on those vacations and not have to worry about the price. You got the money coming in here to buy the fancy clothes and you don't gotta worry about paying for it because it's your assets that are paying for it. It's not what you are working to pay for. This is how wealthy people really become wealthy because if you can build this type of cash flow, well now you have true financial freedom because now you have assets that are paying for your lifestyle instead of just you working to pay for your lifestyle. This is what it means to become wealthy because now it's your assets that will fund your finances. Now the question is, what are these assets that you should be investing in? By the way, if you do wanna stay up to date on what's happening in the top finance and business news, because you want to be an investor, well then you can join something like Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter that I created to help investors stay up to date on what's happening in things like the housing market, the stock market, the economy, and everything in between. It's a completely free newsletter. If you wanna join Market Briefs, I got the link for you down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. So what are these types of assets that you can invest in that way you can generate this type of cash flow? Now, I'm gonna go over mainly two types of assets. I'm gonna talk about stocks and I'm gonna talk about real estate because these are probably the two most accessible ways for the average person to generate this type of cash flow. When you go out and you invest in a company in the stock market, what you're doing is you're literally buying a business. If you go out and you buy one share of the Amazon company, you become one of the owners of the Amazon company. If you go out and you buy one share of the Apple company, you become one of the owners of Apple. If you go out and you buy one share of Chipotle, you become one of the owners of Chipotle. If you go out and you buy one share of Sweetgreen, you become one of the owners of Sweetgreen. You get the idea. Now you're literally buying one of the pieces of ownership in that business instead of just buying a product that this business sells. Most people just think about businesses as their products. You go and buy things on Amazon. You buy the newest iPhone. You buy a Chipotle bowl. You buy a sweet green salad. That's how most people are wired to think. When you go out and you invest in a stock, now you're actually buying the business instead of the product. Well, some companies in the stock market, not all of them, but some companies on the stock market pay what's called a dividend. A dividend is a cash payment that you get as an investor for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now again, not every company pays out a dividend. And the reason why is because for a company to pay out this dividend, they have to have a big profit. So now when a company makes a profit at the end of the year, there's three things that they can do with this cash. Number one is they can save this money in case of an emergency. Number two is they can reinvest this money back into the company. Or number three is they can just give it away to you, one of the shareholders, one of the owners. Now, when it comes to saving the money in a company, you gotta think from the perspective of a business owner. If a company makes $100 million of profit and they kept $100 million in their bank account, well, there's dead cash sitting there. Not every company wants a ton of dead cash sitting there because the $100 million isn't generating a return for the company. Companies want to do something with their money or at least give this money to their owners. And so if a company has a big enough bank account or a big enough savings account, they might not wanna save more money which then brings us to option two, which is reinvest the money back into the company. Now, if it's a smaller startup growth company, you bet they're gonna wanna invest all of this money, maybe and some more, 
through debt and other investment money back into the company because they want to grow bigger. They want to expand their market share. They want to be a larger company. And when a company is trying to grow, they're going to be investing everything that they can to open new stores, open new manufacturing plants, open new research and development facilities. That way they can keep expanding and growing their market share. But when a company becomes even bigger, and now you're a much larger conglomerate, and you don't really see that opportunity to keep investing and growing as quickly, now you might not want to reinvest all this money back into the company, which leaves now this cash back in the bank account. And if you don't want to just save it, well, then you can give this money away to the shareholders, people like you who own a piece of the stock. Now, this is called a dividend. And companies that pay a dividend generally pay out this dividend quarterly, meaning every three months. So now, if you buy a stock that's paying a dividend, that means you're going to get a cash payment every three months for doing nothing except owning the stock. Now, does this come with risk? Of course. If you invest in a company on its way to bankruptcy, well, eventually they might cut that dividend, or they'll have to cut that dividend. Plus, you could also see the value of that stock fall. And this is where you have to understand how to value an investment and know how to research a good stock. And you might be saying, but just breathe. I don't want to do all that. I don't want to keep up with the company. I don't want to research the stock. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to research the financials. That's okay. You don't have to. The alternative to investing into an individual company is to invest in something like a fund, maybe a dividend paying ETF, a dividend paying index fund, a dividend paying mutual fund. Now, instead of investing in one company, like let's just say Apple, now you can invest into a basket of companies that have say 500 different companies in here and Apple is just one of the companies and there's 499 other dividend paying companies in here. So now you can go out and find these dividend paying funds. Again, you have ETFs, mutual funds, index funds. You go out and find one of these dividend paying funds that invest in companies that are paying a dividend. Now you invest in one thing that's investing in 500 different companies. Now you can lower your risk because if Apple were to go bankrupt, well now you have 499 companies to balance it out. This way you can lower your risk and keep getting those dividends that way now you can just keep throwing your money into one of these funds. So this is option one. You can invest into an individual company. I am not telling you what to invest in. Just giving you an example. You can invest into an individual company that's paying a dividend, or you can invest into a fund that's paying a dividend. But again, the key is you got to just keep reinvesting that money. Option number two is you invest in real estate. Now you're going to go out and buy a property. Maybe it's a house, Maybe it's an apartment complex. Maybe it's an office building, if that's something you're into. Maybe it's a retail building. Maybe it's a mixed use building. Maybe it's a storage building. You're going out and you're buying this property, but you're not buying it to live in or use yourself. You're buying it to rent out to somebody else. So now you buy this property, you rent it out to somebody else. Maybe they'll live in or use this property. And then in exchange for them living in and using your property, they pay you rent. Now the key here, is this rent has to be enough to cover your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, any vacancy costs, and then if you have any debt, cover that as well, and then put some money in your pocket each and every month. That's the right way to invest in real estate. You have some people, especially when you're in a very hot seller's market like we've been seeing, when you're in a very hot seller's market, you will see investors go out who have a lot of cash, just go out and buy properties and say, you know what? I'm okay losing money every single month because I think this property is going to be more valuable next year. So I'll be able to flip it for a profit. That's not the game that I play. That's too risky. That's too speculative because I have no idea where housing prices or real estate prices are going to be in a year. I don't like to play that game. What I like to do is I want to make sure I can make a profit in my cash flow every single month and just keep working to accumulate the cash flow. I just want to keep stacking the cash flow because now I know, okay, this property is going to make me $250 a month. If this property is going to make me $250 a month, I got to buy a second one for another $250 a month. After 10, I got $2,500 a month coming in in profit. After 100, I got $25,000 coming in in profit. And now it's a game of just stacking cash flow and how fast can I stack that cash flow. Now again, you don't have to be a real estate investor. You don't have to invest in stocks but you have to start putting your money to work if you want to start generating the cash flow. There's some people on the internet that say that the only way to build wealth is to invest in real estate. Well, there's a lot of people that have become extremely wealthy without ever touching real estate. You have some people that say, you have to go out and invest in the stock market if you want to be wealthy. Well, there are some investors that only invest in real estate that have never touched the stock market that have become extremely wealthy. What you need to do is find the right balance for you. Personally, I invest in stocks and I invest in real estate. It's just something that I'm interested in. 
you don't have to go out and blindly follow anybody else. You don't want to be a sheep. The idea is for you to go out and build your financial education, learn how to invest, and find the right strategy that works for you, that works for your family, and that works for your financial goals. Because at the end of the day, if you want to invest your money, you just want to make sure you get the best returns. For me, I like cash flow because cash flow is something that I can predict. And when I got the cash flow coming in, well, now I know I can go out and spend my money, at least the cash flow that I'm generating, and I don't really have to worry about it because even next month, I'm going to get another cash flow check. That's the way that I like to run my finances. So if you want to invest your money, you got to figure out the right strategy for you. And well, this goes over a couple ways that you can invest your money for cash flow. Find the next Tesla or Amazon. The reality is building long-term sustainable wealth and growing it in the stock market is not easy. Yeah, it looks easy when you're in a bull market because everybody's making money. Then it's easy. You can just throw your money anywhere and you're going to make money. But when things go bad and times get rough, which will happen, you have to anticipate this. This is where you have 